We continue with our celebration of the Reformation. Let's ask God's blessing as we begin. Father, uh, may we speak truth today. As we go back through the years, may we come to understand and relate to the events of the time of Luther. May we appreciate that you have, you have worked uh, sovereignly through events and, and were made possible. And thus, our knowledge of the truth, our salvation, our assurance of that salvation, these glorious things. And we thank you for that. And pray now that we may uh, think deeply upon what we hear. And I pray for me uh, to speak truth and ask it in Christ's name. Uh, there's a, a town in Germany uh, called Passau. Uh, it is also called, in the Germans call it, the City of Three Rivers. Uh, and three rivers come together. We call that confluence. They flow together. And the confluence of three rivers. They're the Danube, that's the biggest river, the Inn, and the Eel. When we come to Luther, we have the confluence of a number of factors. And they are important to study them and to understand them in order to know how this is all possible. Now, if you can, if you want, uh, in my profession of being a historian, most historians are unbelievers, professional historians. Many of them are Christians. We was one society for uh, Christian historians, Pides and Historia. But most of them are not. And uh, so they probably will say, well, this is just uh, the coincidence, you know. As Christians, you look at something like this, I do at least, and I think you would, and you say, there is no way this can be a coincidence. This has to be the working of a sovereign God. There are too many little details that come together at just the right time, this confluence. That's what we want to see today, as well as the action of Luther. Uh, they are political, they are theological, and they are technical, okay? I think the smallest river of, of those three that I gave you was the eel, so the, in one sense the smallest is the technical, but in one sense it's very, very, very big. Now, I don't want to bore you with these political events, but you can say, I'm bored, go on, do something else. <laughs> But anyway, it's important. It's important to know these political events. Um, it's important to know that there was such a thing as a feudal system that was still very much in place in Germany. And that feudal system made possible these, these things. For instance, they had an emperor. He's called Holy Roman Emperor. He's the German emperor. Theoretically, he claimed to be the emperor of the whole world. But in fact, he wasn't. In fact, he was elected, and he was like a CEO serving at the pleasure of the board. He didn't have all power. Uh, he didn't control many areas. Certain emperors were gradually getting more and more power, trying to at any rate, and that's the case in the time of Luther. In 1356, the Germans passed a constitution, and by the terms of that constitution, the emperor was not, he's not just automatically succeeded by his son, hereditary monarchy. The Germans have been trying for centuries to accomplish that, but never did. And, and now it is constitutionalized that the, the power is in the hands of these electors. There were seven of them. Three of them were ecclesiastical, and four of them were secular. Uh, the four secular, the Margrave of Brandenburg, that's the area around Berlin. The Count Palatine of the Rhine, centered in Heidelberg. The King of Bohemia, that is now the Czech Republic. And the Duke of Saxony. There were three ecclesiastical. The Archbishop of Mainz, 
Gülle, Cologne, and Trier. Interestingly enough, those were all three, three cities that were on the west side of the Rhine and were part of the Roman Empire. They're trying to establish this connection of being Roman Empire. So, the emperor at the time uh, of Luther was Maximilian I. He was very powerful. He was trying to be more powerful. Maximilian uh, was a Habsburg. And as a Habsburg, he inherited Austria. He was elected emperor, so that gave him power over Germany. He married the daughter of the Duke of Burgundy. That's Mary of Burgundy. Her father, Charles VI, was trying to create a kingdom out of Burgundy. Burgundy is the east part of France. And the Burgundian in her duchy had been able to gain control of Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg, in addition to Alsace-Lorraine, on the east part of France. So Maximilian married Mary, and that meant he would now have control over that, because Mary inherited because Charles didn't have a son. So now Maximilian and his heirs would have all of that, if you're following. That's Austria, Germany, the Low Countries, and Burgundy. And their son, Mary and Maximilian's son, was Philip. He would inherit all that. And Philip married a daughter. It depends on who you marry. In respect to the Habsburgs, they love to intermarry. Gave them power by marriage. He married Joanna. It was Joanna. She was the eldest of three daughters of Ferdinand and Isabella. Ferdinand, the king of Aragon, and Isabella, the queen of Castile. So now we have this new nation of Spain put together. And Spain has, as you know, said, uh, Christopher Columbus, we have New World, we have all these colonies in South America, Central America, and all that. And that belongs to Spain. And Joanna inherited all of that because they don't have any sons. They have three daughters, and she's the eldest. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so, we have that. It doesn't pass to the other daughter who married Henry VIII, Catherine. It passes to Joanna. Okay. If that's mine, Bob. <laughs> so that means whoever is their heir would theoretically inherit everything except France and England. All of Europe plus the New World. That's a huge inheritance. And it happens that Philip died before his dad. Philip died in 1516. Maximilian doesn't die until 1519. So what is shaping up is an election, a very important election of the emperor. And if the son of Philip and Joanna is elected, he's going to have this huge amount of territory, and the French say, no way, we can't have that. So the French king runs for emperor of Germany. He throws his hat in the ring. The French king, Francis I. And, and now the electors are having to make a decision. Are we going to elect a Frenchman? Or are we going to elect a German who is going to have this huge amount of power? That's the situation. Now the swing man, as it turns out, I'm going to project a little ahead. The swing man in this is going to be the Duke of Saxony. Because it happens that three electors line up for Frederick, I mean for Charles, rather, and three line up for Francis. And the swing man was Frederick III, who is the Duke of Saxony, where Luther is. He is Luther's lord and protector, see? Now, tell me God's not behind that. <laughs> now, theologically, we've got some things happening. In Rome, the Pope is Leo X. He is the son of Lorenzo de' Medici of Florence. 
And he wants to complete a project started by his predecessor, who he is. But his predecessor, Julius II, tore down St. Peter's Cathedral, which was a huge Gothic church, and wants to build a Renaissance temple. Because by now the Renaissance has come to Rome and it comes in imperial magnificence. And they want to create a, a new Rome under the Pope's leadership. So he, he's going to build this beautiful new church. And if you've been to Rome, you've seen it. Because it did get built. <laughs> so that's the dream of Leo X. He wants to build it. But he's bankrupt. So he needs some money. Okay, enter this. The, the, the Margrave of Brandenburg, who is one of the electors, and he knows that the old emperor is about to die, and he goes to the Pope on behalf of his kid brother, Albrecht. Albert. Your Holiness, my brother would like to be considered for the position of Archbishop of Mainz. The Archbishop of Mainz had died. That's another electoral position. His Holiness says, well, I believe your brother, who is only 23 years old, is already the Bishop of Halberstadt and the Bishop of Magdeburg. That's called pluralism when you hold more than one church office. And now your brother wants to be considered for a third office? Hmm. Um, what consideration? is there being offered in this position. Now, when you offer a consideration to the Pope, in other words, you pay him, that is called simony. Technically, it was illegal, but it was done, because it's very convenient. It would give the Pope money that he needs to build St. Peter's Cathedral. Well, Your Holiness, said the Margrave, we are prepared to offer 10,000 gold Venetian ducats. Uh, there were two coins that were particularly in use at this time, the coin of Venice and the coin of Florence, because Byzantium was gone. Uh, and the Pope said, hmm, it seems to me that there are 12 apostles. Therefore, 12,000 gold ducats would be appropriate. <laughs> and the Margrave said, your holiness, May I remind you that there are but seven deadly sins. There are <laughs> 7,000 gold targets. And Leo realized that Leo was in the works. And he said, well, there are 10 commandments. There are 10,000 gold targets. And that was the agreement. And the Pope said, but your, your brother is only 23. He needs a dispensation for being underage. If you get the point, if you're young and you buy an office, you're going to live a long time, likely, so it's not going to have much turnover. And so therefore, there's an extra charge for being young. <laughs> he added 14,000. So that made 24,000. Well, the Pope is bankrupt, but so are the Brandenburg. So the Brandenburgs will say, well, we don't have that money. Well, I have thought about that, said the Pope. I have arranged a loan for you from the Cougar Bank in Augsburg. And uh, well, and, and I have a way for you to pay it back. You're going to make payments, so I have a way for you to pay it back. Uh, it, you will sell indulgences throughout the Brandenburg territory. Uh, and certain uh, uh, characteristics for this, uh, it's a little more elaborate than usual. It's called a plenary indulgence, which meant full forgiveness of sin. So he would sell the indulgences throughout Brandenburg, and he said, I have arranged for an excellent indulgence seller. Uh, his name is Johann Tetzel. He's a Dominican monk. And he puts on this big show uh, in every town where he goes, shows the devil uh, torturing people in hell. And now you can get people out of hell, out of purgatory, actually, out of purgatory, by a pit. Uh, he had this little rhyme uh, when the copper in, in the kettle clinks, uh, cleans, uh, a soul out of, out of purgatory springs. So 
in, in German, the Republic of was Kettle. So, um, anyway, um, what is indulgence? Very quickly, there is a procedure known as, there's a sacrament known as penance. That is what you, and we talked about that before. After you sin, after uh, baptism, you go to the ceremony of, uh, sacrament of penance to be forgiven. Um, and there are four things we noted that were necessary. Uh, then the idea comes up that if you, if you go to something special, like a, if you participate in the crusades as a soldier, or you make a pilgrimage, or you adore a relic, you might be able to get a little time off your sentence in purgatory. That derives from what they call the treasury of merit. According to the doctrine that developed over years, the saints were those who died without any venial sins. Venial sins don't send you to hell, they send you to purgatory. You have mortal sins that send you to hell. Venial, venial sins uh, are sins that are not going to condemn your soul, but you have to pay when you die, you have to pay for every sin of which you are guilty at that time, and that means many, maybe millions of years in purgatory. So, uh, the treasury of merit is that the, the, these extra good works that the saints have done, they don't need for salvation, and they're just kind of siphoned off and put in the treasury of merit, and the, the Pope can draw off those, the treasury of merit and apply it to you when you do something special like one of Crusade or Adora Rally, uh, something very, very special. But then people say, well, I can't, I'm, I'm sick, I'm old, I'm, I, I can't go on a crusade, I, I can't do these things. Maybe could I possibly just pay? <laughs> well, yes. So you see, it was, it was, I will say this in fairness to the Roman Catholic Church, there were many in the Roman Catholic Church that said this is not right. This is abuse. It was a questionable doctrine at best, but when the Pope, who was very secular and didn't have a spiritual bone in his body, when he <laughs> wants money, it's convenient. You know? So this is the idea of indulgences. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> so the, the indulgence sale is arranged, and Texel is going to sell it. Now, he was to stay in the Brandenburg territory and not cross the Elbe River into Saxony, but, and he did, he kept his deal, part of the deal, but many people from Saxony crossed the river and went to, into the Brandenburg territory and were buying indulgences from Tetzel, and coming back and just as happy as they were going directly to heaven when they died, it's kind of like a go to heaven free card, you know. And... <laughs> And Luther wasn't too happy when he saw that. Um, he was upset. Now, I tried to ask, <coughs> ask myself, <coughs> was he really angry and furious? Maybe, I don't know, but I think what he wanted to do was to look into this. He wanted to discuss it. He wanted to debate it. He wanted, and he wanted ultimately to convey to the Pope, Your Holiness, this is not right. You wouldn't want this. I know you want the best for your people, and this just isn't right. At this point, Luther doesn't even have the slightest thought of being disrespectful to the Pope, or breaking with the Pope, or the Church, or anything like that. What he wants to do is to debate it. I want this to come into the an academic environment, and I want us to talk about it. I want us to discuss it, because I think something's wrong here. This doesn't make sense. Now remember, by this time, he'd gone through the gates of paradise. He understood that people are justified by faith in Christ alone, and not by works, and therefore that no works have merit in and of themselves. We do good works out of a grateful heart because we are justified. We don't do good works to gain a standing with God. And, and so this needs to be known. This needs to be conveyed to His Holiness. And I believe His Holiness, once He understands it, He will see this is wrong. <laughs> well, this, I think, was, if you read the 
United, I've not been reading the United Pope papers, <laughs> but they they are they were very polite in, in tone to the Pope, very respectful. Uh, but kind of the gist of it goes like this: <clears throat> If the Pope has power over purgatory, why does he not, out of Christian love, just empty it for everybody? And allow everyone to go to him. Why does the Pope build temples of stone in Rome and not temples of the flesh by giving money to the poor? There are poor people everywhere. They need this money. Why is he building this elaborate structure in Rome? And also, he wanted to say this: these indulgences give a false sense of security. People trust in that piece of paper. Uh, the, the Luther movie, which is very well researched, uh, starring uh, Joseph Finnis, however you pronounce his name, by this uh, Irish. Uh, anyway, that movie, if you've seen it, shows this, this woman who had this crippled child, and she goes over in, into Brandenburg and comes back and says, Dr. Luther, look what I have. And, and, and he says, uh, this is just a piece of paper. That's no more than that. It's worthless. Uh, the other, I don't know how much of this, the, these people who do these movies, they do a lot of, they research it very well, I think. But the old movie, the old black and white movie of Luther, that uh, shows this, this guy who's kind of passed out from drinking, and, and Luther says, I'm going to see you in the, in the confession. He says, oh, Dr. Luther, I don't have to go to confession no more. <laughs> Uh, what's, what you, look at this paper, I got it uh, over there in, from Tetzel. And, uh, uh, and Luther says, Tetzel, I will put a hole in his drum. He always would be a drum. Tetzel was extravagant. Everybody, the, the, the Catholic Church admitted he's very extravagant. And once this got back uh, to Rome, he was dismissed. Now, that's what the 95 Theses are. And on October the 31st, we're just a little, we're in the month now. <laughs> this is the month, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 500 years ago, this month, at the end of this month, Luther published his 95 Theses. The tradition is that he took his 95 Theses in Latin and nailed them to the church door, the castle church door in Wittenberg, which was a public bulletin board. Uh, it's not disrespectful to nail things on the church door. Uh, everybody did it. it. It just announced things that were coming up when people went there. And he did it on All Saints Eve, the evening before All Saints Day, which we call it Halloween, All Hallows Eve, All Hallows Eve. And he knew that everybody would come to church the next day. So they will see this on the church door. Now, lately, in the last few years, scholars have been wondering if actually he mailed it because he doesn't actually mention that. Um, we do know he probably, in some way, he published it. I like to think he did mail it. But at any rate, it got published. It, and and, and he, it was in Latin. He's inviting the scholars to come and discuss it. And they, he said a time and place where they could come and meet. Nobody came. None of the scholars came. Now, I can't tell you why they didn't. Like, we don't, this doesn't interest us <laughs> anyway. Luther was there by himself, nobody came. But something else happened. And this is where we, we meet the third river here. The first, of course, is the political, and then the theological, and the third is the technical. Exactly, Roy, you're right. <laughs> he said publishing. The printing press had been invented by this time. And some of Luther's students, now understand, he did exactly what I would in the classroom. What I did in the classroom. When I come to understand theological truth, I'm going to teach it no matter where I am. And I have gotten myself in trouble doing that. But uh, anyway, Luther is so excited that he shared this with his classes. And so his students think this is wonderful. It is, my brothers and sisters, it is. And all of you know that. I can think of this woman uh, 
we had a class at the church where I used to, to preach. We had a class, special class, we were studying it, and this woman broke into tears every time we come. I mean, she really did. She cried. All we had to do was talk about justification by faith, and she cried because it meant that much to her. She understood what it was. She understood what this doctrine, the implications of this doctrine. To be pardoned, to be forgiven once and for all. So his students did. And they saw this publication, wherever it was. I think it was on the church door. But they saw it. They understood Latin, but they also spoke German. They took it down. They said, this is great. Somebody has now dealing with this problem. And of course there was this tremendous, we've talked about it before, this tremendous resentment of the papacy in Germany. And all the money that's going out of Germany to Rome. And so these students translated that, the 95 Theses, into German. Into the common language. And put it on the printing presses. Printed it up in great quantities and it was circulated. Luther had nothing to do with this. It was circulated, and overnight, Germany was on fire. Was on fire. Not everybody understood it, I imagine, because not everybody fully understood the theological implication, but they understood one thing. A German is speaking for us against Rome, and they like that. But many people did understand. And so the consequences of this 95 theses being published in German and circulated on the printing press by this man at this particular political time is the reason that God has used in his infinite providence to enable us to sit here today. And every person on this planet who is not affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church who calls himself or herself a Christian, every single person has been affected by what happened on October 31st, 1517. Any questions? Now, of course, that was the beginning. Luther had no idea where this was going from there. Uh, and he's and you just hold on to those political things if you can remember that. I know it's kind of tedious all of it, but just to realize that Luther's Duke, Frederick, is the key man in all this. And to understand that the obligation of a lord to a vassal under the feudal system, the vassal owes the lord service. Luther was Frederick's vassal by virtue of being a professor at his university. He was his vassal. Frederick owes him, therefore, protection. That's, that's huge. <laughs> okay. Let's pray. Father, well, thank you for our time together, for calling us together. Uh, we're grateful for the work of Martin Luther and all others you raised up to do your work, and we see your hand in all of this. Bless us now as we prepare for worship, and we worship in spirit and in truth. We ask for Christ to be.